So we're slowly going towards uh, understanding how sh ultra short pulses are produced. And on our way, we have uh, discussed what longitudinal modes are. Uh, whatever discussion we are doing now is completely from this introduction to laser spectroscopy. Uh, this is the cover of the book. It's not very costly, 1500 rupees now. It used to be 8000 at one point of time. So the, this is what we are going to follow by and large for next few modules. So to remind ourselves what we have learned is that a laser is, we always think that a laser is monochromatic. But what we have discussed is that it is strictly speaking, most lasers are not. Because they comprise of longitudinal modes. What is the meaning of longitudinal modes? We said that to uh, set up a standing wave, the essential condition that has to be fulfilled by a wave is that the uh, cavity length L must be an integral multiple of a uh, half wavelength, n lambda two by 2 equal to L. So there can be many such modes that, are, uh, that can be there in the laser. As we have discussed earlier, we are not really dealing with n equal to 1, 2, 3. We are dealing with n equal to very large number, 10 to the power 6, 10 to the power 4. So 10 to the power 4 plus 1 is almost 10 to the power 4. So wavelengths of uh, modes that are adjacent to each other do not really vary too much. That is the first thing to understand. Secondly, we have worked out the expression for delta nu, where delta nu is the difference in frequencies of two successive modes, mode number n and mode number n plus 1. And that turned out to be C divided by 2L. And the C divided by 2L is actually uh, an interesting quantity. What is it? C by 2L or 2L by C? What is 2L by C? It is a round trip time. Okay. So it turns out that delta nu, the difference between uh, two modes, two successive modes is equal to round trip time, uh, inverse of round trip time rather. All right. uh, if you do not remember this, you better write it down. We are going to need this later on in this module or next. And this is another thing that we said that if you think of the spontaneous emission band, spontaneous emission spectrum. And if you think of stimulated emission spectrum, we discussed why stimulated emission spectrum is narrower. And we said that let us say that this laser action threshold is somewhere here and we said it is about at half the intensity. We said if the half width at half max is delta lambda, then delta lambda is going to be the half width at the base of the uh, stimulated emission band. Okay. So now we are really talking about not full width at half maximum, but pulse duration, which is the time for a pulse to go from 0 through a maximum to 0. Okay. Well, in this case, it is not really time. Uh, we are talking about lambda, but as you know, frequency and time are interconvertible by Fourier transformation. We are going to invoke it in this uh, module or the next one. This is another thing that we have studied. We asked that if this is the spectrum of a stimulated emission, how many uh, longitudinal modes are there? And the answer was capital N equal to approximately 4 L delta lambda divided by lambda 0 square. What is lambda 0 square? Lambda 0 is the wavelength where the spectral maximum occurs. And uh, what is delta lambda? half width at half maximum of spontaneous emission. So it is basically half width at base of stimulated emission band. And what was uh, that uh, capital delta nu that we talked about a little while ago? Delta nu, what was that delta nu? Fre the difference between frequencies of two successive nodes. So please do not confuse that capital delta nu with this small delta lambda. This delta lambda is for the entire spectrum, for the entire stimulated emission band. That capital delta nu is the difference in frequencies between two successive longitudinal modes. Uh, I have this bad habit of uh, saying normal modes all the time. So if I say normal mode by mistake, I really mean longitudinal modes here. I do not really mean normal modes of vibration or any such thing. 
ok. So, this is another important quantity that we are going to use. So, if you do not remember you do not I do not expect you to remember it, but better write it down it is going to come handy later on. Total number of longitudinal modes is 4 L delta lambda divided by lambda 0 square ok. And then uh, one thing that I would like to draw your attention to which we did not say in the uh, last uh, couple of modules is uh, do not think that the uh, longitudinal modes have spectra that look like delta functions. See so far what are we saying? We are saying that uh, this nth longitudinal mode has some frequency nu n. The next one n plus 1 th longitudinal mode has frequency nu n plus 1. So, that might give you the idea that these are delta functions, but that is not true. Each longitudinal mode has a spectrum which has finite width. Do you agree or do you not agree with this? Let me rephrase the question. Is it ever possible to have a spectrum which is a delta function in the truest sense? No, why not? Yeah? Why can we never get for any system a uh, spectrum which is a delta function? And here I am talking about energy domain spectrum. Yes? So, this takes us back to the semi classical treatment once again, we keep referring to it again and again in this discussion. Time dependent perturbation th theoretical treatment of interaction of radiation with matter. So, there if you work it out, you will see that well of course, you have a spectrum, there are many line broadening mechanisms that can take place. Some of them are homogeneous, some of them are inhomogeneous. We are going to talk about homogeneous and inhomogeneous line broadening mechanisms later in this course, because you cannot have a course talking about lasers and not talking about line widths and uh, in the next couple of modules we get sort of get an idea why right. So, can we name some line broadening mechanisms? Yeah, I will tell you one collisional broadening right molecules that collide with each other they transfer energy and so uh, energies change and that is why spectral line gets broadened. Doppler broadening somebody said Doppler broadening is also correct. So, what is Doppler broadening? It is best understood in terms of emission, your system emits light and it goes towards the uh, detector. Now, if the molecule is also moving towards the detector or away from the detector, then the effective length changes and effective frequency changes very much like what we have studied in class 11 and 12 physics, where the train comes towards you the whistle sounds more shrill, more shrill means frequency is higher and when the engine goes away from you, the it sounds less shrill because there is uh, like more space in that time and the wave is getting broadened that is called Doppler broadening. So, Doppler broadening is an important issue in spectrum, in spectroscopy. But suppose I say that I have a situation where I completely stop uh, collisions, maybe freeze the sample or something, nothing is moving. And since nothing is moving, Doppler broadening also does not arise. Still, there is some mechanism no matter what you do, you cannot get rid of one thing that will invariably add to a uh, line width. Let us say, let us say I have quenched vibration. Of course, I can never quench vibration because it will be in that uh, uh, V equal to 0 state. So, the mechanism that you can cannot do anything about is uh, natural broadening or lifetime broadening right. It is something like you can if I put it very qualitatively what it means is ground state has a lifetime of infinity let us say and excited state has a has some uh, lifetime ok. So, of course, there will be some uh, uncertainty in time and we know uh, uncertainty principle uncertainty in time multiplied by uncertainty in energy is a uh, constant. So, uh, what is the maximum uncertainty time allowed associated with the excited state? Cannot be more than its lifetime. See, if I say I am, my height is 5 feet plus minus 30 feet, does it make any sense? It does not. If I say my height is 5 feet plus minus 5 feet, then also it does not make sense to me for me 
but it does make sense for quantum mechanical objects as you, you can only do so much. So, that is the maximum limit on uncertainty. So, since that uncertainty is limited, you will have some uncertainty in energy also. You cannot have delta E almost equal to 0. Okay? So, speaking very, very qualitatively, that is what gives rise, that is why it is called lifetime broadening. Okay? So, some broadening will be there. Okay? So, uh, it is important to recognize that each mode, each longitudinal mode also has a spectrum that is not a delta function. At least natural line broadening will be there. Let us say that is uh, delta less. My problem is I have used such a color that I myself cannot read. Anyway, so delta less, spectral width of each mode. It is important to recognize that it is there. Okay. Now, next what I will do is I will take a little bit of a detour. We will come back to this uh, mode locking business. Mode locking is the technique we want to discuss today by which you can produce ultra fast pulses. But there is another method by which you cannot perhaps produce an ultra fast pulse, but you can produce say, nanosecond pulses also. It is called Q switching, you are right. So, what is this Q? Where did it come from? Is it James Bond Q or what is it? So, uh, most likely we will have to come back to this uh, issue of Q, but uh, let me for the next 3 4 minutes at least provide a glimpse of what it is. Q is quality factor, Q for quality and uh, it is defined like this 2 pi multiplied by energy gained in the system divided by energy lost during one cycle. Okay. Why will energy gain be there? In a laser, I am talking about laser of course. What is the mechanism by which energy gain can take place? And when I talk about Q, I am talking about the cavity. Okay. So, what happens is you go back to the very basics of lasers. You have this active medium that is giving out light right, and it is doing round trips. In every round trip, the number of photons is getting increased. So, in other words, energy is in increasing, right? That is called gain. And how do I get lost? I mean, I, I do not get lost. How do I lose energy? How does the cavity lose energy? One thing you can think is suppose now light goes out of the cavity, that is actually a loss. Okay? That is what we want. But as far as the system is concerned, it is a loss. But for now, let us not even talk about light going out from there. If you even uh, put 200 percent reflecting mirrors, will it just uh, keep on gaining energy or will there be some? There will invariably be some loss. Why? Because the system will get heated up. Heating is a very big problem in laser. So, you see uh, you have to use things like chillers and all many times when you use uh, powerful lasers. right? Uh, there can be diffraction, there can be uh, scattering. So, there can be many mechanisms. So, this Q is given by 2 pi into energy gained in system by energy lost. And when I say Q switching, what do I mean then? I mean that for some time, I let the Q go up. Right? That means, energy is getting built in the system. Then by some mechanism, I switch the energy out. So, what will happen? At that instant, Q will fall. Right? So, Q will switch from a very high value to a uh, very, very low value. Okay? Then again, uh, Q will start building up. So, if you can somehow achieve this, that is one way of producing pulse laser, Q switching. How we achieve this? We are going to discuss when we talk about uh, the actual instrumentation part. All right. But uh, the point is, uh, since there is some loss, it is no longer fair to think of uh, this wave that I have as just a plane wave, right? It is going to be sort of a damped oscillation if there is a loss, right? So, it will be something like this. Do not worry too much. The, the purpose is not to do every bit of math that is associated, but rather to get a working idea, okay? So, uh, we will take things axiomatically, but these are not all that difficult also. So, something like this, you have an oscillation and there is a decay and this uh, figure here is not really to scale. It is not to scale because this T 0 that you see, T 0 is basically the time difference between two maxima, time interval between two uh, successive maxima and tau is uh, okay, time for decay of amplitude from A 0 to A 0 by E. Does that ring a bell? 
it's sort of something like lifetime time constant right now generally t0 is actually much much smaller than tau otherwise you have a very bad laser all right if it decays completely before even uh, even before doing a cycle then uh, in uh, how will you work so uh, this figure is just uh, uh, is not to scale is drawn in such a way so that you can see all the uh, quantities involved that's all but t0 is actually much much smaller than tau and we are going to use it shortly but let me write something let me write this 2 pi then what is energy gain in the system a0 square what is energy lost in one cycle it will be a0 square minus a0 square into e to the power minus 2 beta by t0 for now don't worry about what beta is we will have to come back to that we can go to the final expression a0 square will cancel between numerator and denominator you are left with 2 pi divided by 1 minus e to the power minus 2 t0 by tau which is a very familiar form of equation for us right okay now uh, we can uh, simplify this expression a little bit precisely because t0 is so much smaller than tau so what will happen if t0 is much smaller than tau how do i expand e to the power minus 2 t0 by tau now this is a technique that we have used in uh, almost all physical chemistry courses right if you do uh, quantum mechanics statistical mechanics whatever you always use this kind of an approximation t0 is much much smaller than tau so how do i expand e to the power minus 2 t0 by tau e to the power minus x when x is very small 1 1 is correct yes so i can write something like this of course there are higher terms but as it always happens higher terms are we are saying that this itself is very small so higher terms will be even smaller so we neglect them so we can just put e to the power minus 2 t0 by tau to be equal to uh, 1 minus 2 t0 by tau and if i take this expression and plug it in into the expression of q what will i get very convenient 1 and 1 will cancel each other what am i left with yeah something like this okay now so 2 and 2 will cancel of course 1 by t0 what is t0 is uh, time period right what is 1 by t0 1 by time period frequency naturally and of course the answer is also in front of you pi nu 0 tau okay and then uh, pi nu 0 is the angular frequency we are going to use angular frequency time and again here because we are uh, dealing with periodic functions they are going to repeat after regular intervals so uh, angular frequency very often turns out to be uh, an easier parameter to use so you get omega 0 tau by 2 okay now next part i am not going to derive i will just tell you that delta less what is delta less spectral width of each mode is given by 2 pi into omega 0 by q okay 2 pi into omega 0 by q so this is the expression for spectral width of each mode the purpose of uh, this discussion is twofold first to emphasize the fact that longitudinal modes do not have delta function spectra second to introduce this important parameter quality factor q which plays a very important role in producing larger pulses and also as we will see later on uh, the same kind of device is used uh, when we want to amplify a laser so q factor is something that will come back again and again now let us come back to uh, our discussion where we had stopped uh, in the last uh, module we said when we take longitudinal modes in a bunch what do you expect to get and we have talked about two situations one in which delta phi is constant what is delta phi phase difference between two successive uh, longitudinal modes constant means it is independent of time and second one where delta phi is a function of time so let us take the second one first if phase difference is a function of time then you have a very chaotic situation right there is no correlation now it is there now it is not there so you are going to get something like this 
okay you are going to get a free running laser with inherent fluctuations that might be there however if delta phi is constant then what happens uh, we did not we discussed it in the last module but uh, we did not really spend too much of time on it so for the benefit of those who might be uh, new to something like this it is not very difficult to understand first of all it is understood quite is simply by using uh, simple day to day analogs okay uh, think of a team of runners five runners and they are running around a field running around gym corner they start together when they start together they are in phase okay when they start running somebody runs faster somebody runs slower what will happen there will be a spread right and then it is possible that they are going to come back all together if they keep on running at the same speed for a long long time there will be times when they come together there will be times when they move away from each other it might be difficult to believe if i am talking about 10 runners but it is absolutely easy to understand if i talk about two right suppose uh, shorodeep and i run a race around jim khana ground what will happen of course he will win because he can run faster he will not win okay <laughs> so let's say tanuja and i run a race tanuja will definitely win right so what will happen we'll start off together then we are in phase right and then what happens is tanuja starts taking a lead and i start lagging and then if our speeds are sufficiently different what will happen eventually she'll catch up i'll have done 5 laps she would have done 6 and she would have caught up with me okay so that time we are again in phase whenever we come together we are in phase when we start moving away from each other dephasing starts and when we are diametrically opposite in the field that is absolute uh, destructive interference right so now just uh, extend this to many runners that is exactly what happens when delta phi is constant well what i discussed is when delta phi becomes zero delta phi equal to zero is easier to understand perhaps what will happen is at this time let us say all the waves are in phase all the maxima match then what will happen x axis is time they have different frequencies so when you go away from here some of these uh, amplitudes will decay slower some of these will decay faster okay so phase difference uh, is there but then what will happen is you don't don't have constructive interference anymore okay so if you look at the re resultant amplitude that is going to fall it might do some beats uh, up and down and then it will become zero after some time they'll come in come together once again okay this is something that you encounter very frequently when you discuss things like nmr spectroscopy in time domain then you talk about interferograms so uh, the important thing here that we are going to use is y axis is amplitude what is the relationship between amplitude and intensity what is the relationship between amplitude and intensity actually mod square field does have uh, an imaginary component okay so mod square if i take mod square of something like this what will i get everything will be positive right it will become sharper so we get something like this okay and as we are going to see in the next module we don't exactly get something like this we get a little more structure in each of the pulses so uh, but the crux of the matter is you get pulsed operation and we are going to show in the next module that separation between two pulses is going to be 2L by C. So what I have written in this may be a little uh, confusing. Did I see the opposite? Okay. A star means uh, uh, complex conjugate. So separation is going to be 2L by C round trip time which is great. this is why we can do mode locking actually because separation between pulses is actually a round trip time and then pulse duration as we are going to show in the next module is 2l divided by cn what is the meaning of uh, n capital n 
number of longitudinal modes that are locked. This is what brings us to mode locking. If we can lock a large number of modes, then we get short pulses because see n comes in the denominator. No? If n is large, then Tp, the pulse duration is going to be small. If n is small, then pulse duration is going to be large. So, what do you need? Do you need a single mode laser or do you need a multi mode laser? You need a multi mode laser. What is the meaning of a multi mode laser? If I put it in simpler terms, the bandwidth should be large, right? When I say bandwidth here, I basically mean the spect spectrum should be as broad as possible. If the spectrum is too narrow, then that will mean you will have lesser number of uh, longitudinal modes there. So, that is one essential condition. That is why it is not so easy to make a uh, an ultra fast laser using a gas as an active medium because it has very sharp lines. You need something that has a broad spectral band, otherwise it will just not work. And uh, so, we see that they are related to each other. An ultra short laser is always going to be a broader band laser. So, if you uh, we are going to go back to the lab and we are going to demonstrate, uh, the way we know that our laser has become pulsed is that we, uh, we are going to discuss how you can uh, measure the pulse width also using something called autocorrelator, but we do not even do that. All we do is we look at the spectrum. If the spectrum is very narrow, then we know that it is not pulsed. If the spectrum is broad, then we know it is pulsed, right. So, uh, that so in the next module, which is going to be perhaps a little smaller than what it what our modules usually are, we are going to uh, sort of derive these expressions, even though t equal to 2L by C might sound uh, uh, an obvious conclusion. But we will still derive it, but while deriving it, we are going to jump steps, we are going to take things axiomatically. Uh, the idea is we want an overall picture of why things are, how they are and another thing that we learn is that this, the way we have drawn it here is actually a simplification. You get a picture like this when you lock a small number of modes. When you lock a large number of modes, you do not get something, you get something that looks a little different that is what we are going to discuss.